This is Epicenter, episode 329 with guest Joe Laluz. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Cuccio. Today, our guest is Joe Laluz. Joe is the CEO of Bison Trails. They're a company which provides staking infrastructure for a variety of proof-of-stake blockchains, including Cosmos, Tezos, Algorand, and many others. And they're testing and adding several new chains on an ongoing basis, like ETH 2.0, of course, that'll be supported when it comes out. Bison Trails focuses on providing enterprise-grade infrastructure, and they've built a really impressive system for deploying nodes across multiple cloud services, spreading microservices across several clouds, and over different geographies. And they recently raised $25 million. So it will be really interesting to see where this company goes because I think it holds a lot of promise. So here's what you'll learn in the interview. How Bison Trails got started and their vision to build a better proof of stake ecosystem for everyone. The types of customers they run validators for and their approach to improving the product. The networks they support and their approach to adding new networks. Their technical infrastructure design and all the cutting edge stuff they're working on in terms of deployment, redundancy, and key storage. How the company thinks about infrastructure centralization and proof of stake. Of course, the question is here if most validators on a network are using the same infrastructure service provider, does that mean the blockchain is centralized? Their involvement in different crypto communities and discussions around protocol improvements. And this is really interesting, their role in the Libra Association and the work they're doing in the Technical Steering Committee. Sonny and May heard that this episode, of course, they both run validators. They're both highly technical, so it was only logical that they would interview Joe. I thought they asked all the right questions and produced an excellent interview. So hats off to them, and I really hope you'll like it. Now, you might have noticed a bonus episode in your feed last Friday, and I wanted to address this briefly because it's the first time we published a sponsored interview. Now, we get a lot of requests to be on the podcast, and we can't honor all of these requests. For one, there's just not enough weeks in the year to run episodes with every company who reaches out to us. And two, sometimes companies have very specific marketing goals that they're trying to achieve. And so we see an opportunity here to enable these companies to sponsor their appearance on the podcast. Now, I've done a lot of thinking about this because our reputation is so important to us. And what it comes down to is making sure that we have a high degree of due diligence for sponsors, for sponsored episodes, and for any project that we have on the podcast for that matter. So this basically sums up my thinking around this. Of course, if there's anything that you want to share with me, you can always reach out to me on Twitter or directly by email at Sebastian at Epicenter.tv. Now, I do want to talk about this episode briefly because many of you are concerned by this. I interviewed Clinton Donnelly. He is a crypto tax expert, and he's helped hundreds of U.S. crypto holders file their taxes. This episode is chock full of excellent practical advice on how to prepare a rock-solid tax return. He shares the most common mistakes that people make, and he talks about two very important anti-money laundering forms that, if filed incorrectly, could cost you tens of thousands of dollars in fines. He has excellent insights and helps us understand how to get inside the head of an IRS auditor. So if you have crypto and you're a U.S. taxpayer, this is a must-listen episode. You'll find it in your podcast feed just before this one. Of course, you already know this, but this week is ECC in Paris, and I am so excited to be going. We have a podcast studio booth up on the third floor. You can't miss us. Come check us out. And if you can't be in Paris this week, You can follow all the action from ECC on Pepo. Go to pepo.com to download the app. And I just want to thank Pepo for making this happen. I think it's so freaking cool that we have a podcast booth. And hopefully I can get rid of this cold so that my voice holds up for all these interviews that I've got planned this week. Anyway, it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm very happy to welcome back to the show as a sponsor, Shapeshift. Now, let me tell you something. The Shapeshift you grew up with is nothing like the Shapeshift of today. Of course, you know Shapeshift as the crypto-to-crypto trading platform, but now you can also buy crypto with fiat, you can trade, you can track, and you can secure all your digital assets in one place. The new Shapeshift is your crypto portfolio dashboard. It allows you to see all of your crypto holdings in one place, and you have trading built in. And when you sign up at beta.shapeshift.com, you'll receive 100 FOX tokens, and you can trade commission-free. So each of these Fox tokens 
equals $10 in trading fees per month, which means you start off on the platform with $1,000 in free trading. You can connect your ledger, your treasure, or your KeepKey hardware wallet. And of course, we're giving these away for free. You just need to do the survey that I mentioned at the top of the show, or you can even create a software wallet to begin your journey. So go to beta.shapeshift.com to get started and be sure to follow them on Twitter at shapeshift underscore IO for all the latest updates as the company continues to build out its robust crypto ecosystem. Status is here. The Status Secure Messaging app is out of beta and available in the Apple App Store and Google Play Store. Status is a private secure communication tool that combines a decentralized messenger, a Web3 browser, and a crypto wallet. With Status, your messages and your identity belong to you. It leverages state-of-the-art protocols to protect your data and never require a third-party validation to create your account. There's no phone number. There's no email address. There's no bank account. You know what there is? There's a private key. That's it. Plain and simple. It's crypto. One of the things I like about Status is that you can easily access the entire DAP ecosystem. And I think that the release of Status is an important milestone because it demonstrates that crypto can address a use case that can potentially reach billions of people. So download Status in the Apple or Google app stores and be sure to join the public channel hashtag Epicenter. Come and say hi, and we'll give you some free SNT tokens to help you get started. And with that, here is our interview with Joe Laluz. So we're on here today with Joe Laluz, who is the CEO of Bison Trails. Nice to have you on, Joe. Thanks so much for having me, guys. I'm really, really excited to be here and real excited to, for the conversation today. Yes, I mean, re- really happy to have you on. I think you are the, you know, you're the first proof of stake infrastructure related person that we've had on the show. I don't, know, I don't know if it's partially because you know three of the hosts are like running proof of stake infrastructure, so we've always felt a bit weird having an, <laughs> a, another proof of stake person infrastructure person on. But you know, it, it, glad to see you on to finally, you know, it's, it's been something that's been people have been calling it the year of staking. So it's good to finally have someone actually running staking on as a uh, as a guest. <laughs> so before we jump into the uh, staking stuff, could you tell us a little bit about what your background is? And I know you are, you've done a number of startups in the past and, you know, you were a partner at some venture funds. How did you get involved with startups and entrepreneurship? And Yeah, ab- absolutely. So again, thanks for having me on the show, even though I know you, you all have a lot of experience uh, in the uh, infrastructure space in proof of stake, which uh, hopefully I think will make for like a really great conversation because it's relatively rare that I get to have you know interview type conversations with folks that you know have a maybe like deeper or more nuanced uh, understanding of like what we're doing and and why we're doing it. So definitely looking forward to that. As far as uh, my background goes, uh, and I'm you know obviously very uh, happy to share uh, this as well. Uh, so I've been a, a, a startup founder for the majority of my career. So I've been a my co-founder and I have been working together for. Close to 17 years, we built a, a few venture-backed companies together. Venture-backed being that uh, you know they were uh, software companies financed by venture capitalists. We worked on probably 20 or 30 different projects that never really made it into sort of company state or company stage. You know, a couple of proof of concepts or you know MVPs that ultimately we either decided weren't wasn't really worth pursuing or didn't sort of didn't pan out. Our hypothesis didn't pan out the way we thought it would. And uh, however, we've you know also had a couple that um, did make it into the sort of like company phase, company stage, and we you know put together some financing and, and built a team and built a really great product. So you know a couple of what I would say like sort of successful outcomes, and then a whole bunch of failure outcomes, <laughs> which is uh, all part of the process. And uh, yeah, you know, so we're, we're both technical. I'm the CEO of Bison Trails. Uh, I'm a software engineer. I've been a software engineer uh, my whole life. Uh, my co-founder is also. He's the CTO of Bison Trails uh, and also a software engineer and really uh, have been focused our whole careers on building software services and products, in particular in sort of emerging spaces and emerging technology spaces. If people kind of ask like the, I've, I've gotten the question, I shouldn't say people ask, but I, I've gotten the question a couple of times, you know, why crypto or how blockchain or, <laughs> you know, how or why are you involved in this space? And Funny enough, like I, I tend to skip the when <laughs> blockchain or when crypto question because the truth is that we've actually been pretty involved in some way, shape, or form in the blockchain and crypto space 
since like really, really early days, but not because we were building in the space or because we were fortune tellers and could tell the, the future, but really because we're just huge nerds. You know, my first my first interaction with um, Bitcoin, which was my first interaction with crypto, was a colleague of mine who was infrastructure engineer at a, a company um, that we were working on together was running Bitcoin mining on my company infrastructure. And we were like, hey, what are these long running <laughs> processes that are running on these servers, <laughs> <laughs> you know, out in out in our data center? I actually don't even want to call it a date, but I think it was probably somewhere in like 2011 ish, you know, like I'm not sure exactly when it was, um, but that was like one of my first experiences. And then realizing like, Oh, Holy smokes, this is really cool. This is really interesting. And, and that was kind of like when we first started getting it like interested in the space. And so we've been working on bison trails for about three years now. We've uh, you know, we've only really been building in the space for about you know three or, or so years. I've been definitely interested uh, and a participant in, in, in the space. Uh, for for many many years and 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 so you know really excited about where the space is going and kind of being able to finally from a professional perspective work day to day uh, on blockchain and crypto but yeah you know like you mentioned worked on a few different projects uh, have been the ceo and founder of a few different uh, startups the most recent one uh, was a company called grand street it was an online marketplace specifically focused on folks that were building new hardware devices which is interesting when I was one of the first projects I looked at at infrastructure in the blockchain space was actually looking at trying to demystify or create transparency around the mining processes in proof of work networks and had spent a lot of time in China where most of the hardware manufacturing was happening around these, these, uh, you know, ASICs around specific devices and um, was a really good springboard for me because our previous company, which was a marketplace focused on hardware development, had put us in contact with a lot of folks in uh, Shenzhen and in uh, sort of southern China where a lot of electronics manufacturing actually happens. You know, kind of interesting, interesting little tidbit there uh, about, you know, some of the first projects. And then similarly, like you said, uh, have been uh, an investor, but actually an angel investor. So um, I run a very small angel fund with my co-founder uh, and another one of our partners. We're three of us um, and we invest in founders. So we don't run like a venture or venture capital fund. I'm not really affiliated with any venture capitalists, but we, uh, you know, as entrepreneurs, sort of said, you know, one of the things we'd always like to do is uh, be able to give back to other entrepreneurs. We know how hard it is to start companies and how hard it is to get off the ground. And and so for the last five or six years, we've been uh, investing in entrepreneurs at sort of the angel stage out of this quote unquote fund. <laughs> but it's really you know, uh, just our own money. Uh, and we, we spend a lot of time working with and advising early stage founders, helping them kind of get off the ground and understand, the, you know, the, the nuances of building a new product and getting getting people excited about it and you know iterating on it and all that stuff. And uh, as a participant in the blockchain and crypto space, one of the first things uh, I actually did was, you know, really quite frankly, like you know, was more from an investor perspective, right? Like, you know, either mining or, or buying Bitcoin or other uh, crypto assets like uh, Ethereum or, or, you know, any of the other ones. So that's, that's a little bit of my background, you know, currently a hundred percent focused on uh, Bison trails and, hundred uh, percent of my time, <laughs> I want to say every day, all day, every weekend, <laughs> every night, all the time. I'm not, I'm not sleeping. I'm spending uh, focused in, on building a really great team of, you know, super technical folks uh, to help uh, make it easier for folks to participate in blockchain networks. One of my curiosities has been Bison Trails has been in operation for something like 20 months or 21 months, correct? Well, it's actually. A little bit longer than that. Um, it's actually closer to, to three years. It's like officially about 20 months or so. I think like if you look at like our company formation documentation and stuff like that, it's like about 20 months. But before we even went through any of that stuff, we spent a lot of time building out like MVP products. Essentially, the, the product is you allow any party that wants to run infrastructure, be it nodes or validators for proof of stake networks. My curiosity is, I mean, I have been in the proof of stake space myself for two and a half years, and I, I can confidently assert that maybe two years back, there weren't any people looking to run validators for proof of stake networks. So given the customer demand wasn't there, why did you get into this vertical of having people run validators? Because I came across no customers at that point. It's a really great question, and it actually allows me to kind of sidestep into a little bit of the backstory around Bison Trails. 
you know, it really is like why I build this product and why I build this product now. So I'd mentioned quickly that really early on in, in sort of my building phase of, of my crypto and, and blockchain experience that we were looking, my co-founder and I were looking at creating transparency around this concept of securing a blockchain um, and infrastructure around the blockchain. Uh, and so, you know, really this, this came out of founder and software engineer and technical person's mindset of, you know, you want to engage in something that you need to understand exactly how it works. How do you take it apart? How do you break it into pieces? How do you understand all the different pieces? And one of the things that we had found when we were looking at the blockchain space, and this was, you know, call it three, four years ago, was that there was probably some of the most interesting and smartest people that I had ever met were working on designing, building, pushing, you know, code to uh, these open source protocols. And they were, they were working on existing blockchains, not even like new ones, but like existing blockchains and protocols and some of the new blockchains and protocols that were sort of in development. And these people were some of the smartest people I'd ever met and ever had a chance to interact with, which is very cool. However, if you actually looked at what was powering the chains themselves and what was securing the chains themselves, and at the time in proof of work, it was mostly you know mining, and you started talking to folks that were doing mining, not everybody, because I don't want to overgeneralize, but a lot of the folks were incredibly cagey, very closed off, didn't want to actually talk about what they were doing and why they were doing that. Uh, and for me, it felt like there's this crazy dissonance in, in a market that I felt very passionate about which was you know, really open, really collaborative protocol blockchain development, and then really closed off, uh, really cagey, sort of closed-minded, like mining and security and infrastructure. And to me, that didn't make any sense. And so uh, really early on, we were like, let's, let's actually just open this up. You know, one of, the, one of our first sort of initiatives, it wasn't like, let's go build a mine or let's go build a company that focuses on proof of stake or let's go do you know, X, Y, and Z. It was actually like, let's, how, do, how would one open this up? How would one look at the space and say, okay, I want to create more transparency here. I want to make it easier for people to understand how this works. I want to make it easier for people to truly understand like how a business works here. Uh, and so the, we did that the only way we know how as founders, which is like, let's build, let's build it, let's build it. So one of the first things we did was actually built a proof of work mine. So my co-founder and I own and operate an automated a proof of work mine in the Pacific Northwest. Um, we built that from the ground up and, you know, not because we wanted to specifically get into mining, but because we really wanted to have a deep understanding of how uh, blockchain infrastructure works and how securing a network works. And at the time, that was mostly proof of work. Really quick, can you explain what an automated mine is? Yeah, it's, you know, so so when you look at, um, I can. Also, I should like probably characterize that a little bit better. It's not an automated mine. We automated a lot of the processes around mining. Things like, you know, how do you operationalize a mine? So we write like custom software to do things that normally were done in a mine that were done manually. So we have very little staff that actually run the mine. Um, there's almost nobody there ever. Um, things like, you know, diagnostics or identifying portions of the mine that are off or not working well or temperature control. So like the things that matter in, in, a, in a proof of work mine are what your electricity costs are, how your hardware is running, and then gen generally speaking, temperature and cooling. So in a normal scenario or in a lot of proof of work mines, if you've ever been to one, I don't know if you have, but if you've ever been to one, there's often a lot of staff that are kind of like, you know, running around doing stuff and uh, measuring things. And we said to ourselves, like, hey, we can operationalize the hell out of this by writing software, which is something that we're un uniquely positioned to do being software engineers. And so we did a lot of that stuff. Um, so we still have some folks that um, help us out, but it's like, you know, pretty ad hoc. And uh, a lot of the things that you would sort of do on a day to day basis to diagnose an issue with something like a miner or a network, we bring software to automatically do. Even as simple as like, hey, this thing's not working. Like, how do we automatically restart it? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and, and, and in doing that, we actually talked a lot about like some of the issues. So when we built this mine, we actually did it um, with some friends, some other angel investors and other folks in the space and said like, hey, we're building a mine. Like, this is what we're doing. And uh, we were pretty public and vocal about um, the process. I've actually been thinking about maybe like publishing some of like our, some of our like investor updates. It's Unfortunately, it's not, it's something I don't have to get everybody kind of on board with, but I don't think anybody would really be against it. Maybe I'll do that. So is this mine uh, operated by Bison Trails or is it something that you guys did separately before Bison Trails? Yeah, completely, completely separate. It's something we did before Bison Trails. Um, I would say it's like a, you know, one of the, one of the first projects we did before starting to really work on, but we were kind of like in tandem working on Bison Trails while we were building this thing out. And it's actually the name, the name Bison Trails comes from that project. The very, very short version is that we had, while we were building out this mine, we'd spent a lot of time in places where building out a proof of work mine is a favorable place to be. 
generally you're looking for cheap power. We were specifically focused on renewables because we only wanted to use wind and water. The places where you find those things are kind of like in mountainous regions in the middle of the country or in the Pacific Northwest, uh, in the United States, I should say, in the middle of the United States. And we had, at the time, spent a lot of time in Wyoming. And the state animal of Wyoming is the bison. And when we were naming the company, we were like, why don't we name it something? Instead of naming it something that sounds like very sort of infrastructure why don't we name it something that gives a little bit of a hat tip to some of the early work that like sort of led us here? And if you don't know anything about bison, they're actually really interesting animals. In the early pioneer days, uh, in the sort of gold rush days, pioneers would follow paths that bison had paved across the country, these bison trails. And so they were sort of like a, a leader in showing people the path forward. And we thought that was like a really cool, inter- uh, interesting piece of imagery. And that's where the name comes from. That's a cool story. It's definitely a welcome change from like, you know, like the 20 or 30 different validator companies that have the word stake somewhere in their name. So definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And honestly, naming a company is always really hard. <laughs> so uh, you sort of have two options, like make it really literal or make it something that's like, you know, just interesting and something relevant to you. And we, we opted for the latter, which I'm very happy about because I actually like the name a lot. I think it's, it has like some fun imagery and some fun, fun branding to it. But yeah, so that's what I mean by automated mine. It's not really automated, right? It's it's uh, we've automated some of the process, operational processes around it to that make uh, running a mine a little bit cumbersome or uh, have a lot of overhead and costs. And so I should also note that in doing that, you actually reduce your cost significantly. So independently mine a few different networks, and we do that at a pretty pretty low cost relative to the rest of the hash rate on the network. So, anyways, I was kind of saying like why. <laughs> why build a why build a platform to help folks deploy validators? And really what I was kind of getting at was we really wanted to open up the whole process and make it a lot easier. And in starting to understand proof of work and understanding how the these networks were secured and, and how blocks were formed and, and how mining worked, we actually started realizing that uh one, if you want to be a miner or you want to get involved in the space, like you're basically connecting to one of you know four or five major mining pools, which kind of sucks because you have like centralization around decision making, whether you want, like it or not. Um, otherwise, it's so uneconomical to be a part of it that people just don't do it. So that didn't really make sense. And two, we found ourselves in this position where operationally running a mine is fine, but it doesn't really play to our strengths all that much. You know, we're so, like I said early on, we're software engineers. My co-founder and I are both software engineers. We've built you know large scale uh, software projects for many many years, and so we were you know paying really close attention to the sort of protocol space and realizing that there's a shift happening towards using alternative consensus mechanisms to secure networks, in particular, things like proof of stake, where you move away from like hardware specific or ASIC based you know, models to secure a network, and you move more towards a, a, a model where superior infrastructure can support both the security as well as message propagation, reading and writing from a protocol. And so we were really intrigued by that and, you know, things like um, infrastructure as code and like understanding how we can make it way easier for more people to participate in these blockchains. Um, and, I, you know, I, I think like, you know, at the time, like kind of Tezos was still sort of, you know, hadn't really launched yet. And Cosmos was still pre game of stakes. And, and so, you know, there was, this was, I want to say probably about two years ago ish, you know, and we were looking at the space and saying like, okay, if this is a successful space, the way this is going to be successful is if there is, much easier ways for folks to run validators and run infrastructure on these networks, not just to secure the network, but also to make it a more a healthier ecosystem for people to um, interact with um, the protocols themselves. And so to, to answer the question, like the reason why we were doing it is we weren't looking at this and saying like, oh, there's customer demand for this today. We were looking at it and saying like, what do we want the world to look like? I want the world to look like massive distribution of token so that lots of folks are using these protocols uh, you know, developers are using them. And really, as a, you know, a core tenant or an ethos of the space, like if you are interacting with a network like Cosmos or a Tezos, it should be part of your duty to help secure the network and run validation on that network and run, you know, nodes on that network. Um, and that, that's kind of like, you know, the, the gist of kind of why we started doing that uh, and why we started building this this platform. It was really to sort of support this thesis that if any of these protocols and if the entire proof of stake protocol space was going to be successful, there needed to be a lot of people that could do it. We needed to have networks that could support, you know, not just the protocols themselves but, and consensus and, you know, BFT protocols in particular, being able to support hundreds or thousands of nodes, but it needed to be possible for people to do it. And it actually 
needs to be secure and incredibly well orchestrated and run. And, and so that's kind of like the sort of impetus behind the company and why we think it's important what we're doing and why we're excited about what we're doing. Does that answer the question? Yes, sure. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's a long-winded way of saying we wanted to build it for something that we wanted to see as opposed to the thing we were seeing today. I guess one of the questions I have in my mind is where do you see the proof of proof of stake validation ecosystem go in the next 5 or 10 years like which parties are going to be the major validators that's a that's a good question by parties do you mean like what types of companies or like who or what groups so maybe for the listeners so proof of stake validators today are what like exchanges then you have custodians then you have some hobbyists right then you have some professional validation companies uh, that just do validation you have some you know funds crypto funds venture capitalists doing validation and those are i think the major parties today and then you could add a few putative potential parties to this list so there would be a, f- a firm like fidelity you know traditional traditional finance entity running running validators very much possible hope so right and all of these parties come to the validation game with very different strengths and very different focus areas and some of them are well equipped for the validation game others are not and so my curiosity is what do you think happens in in 5 or 10 years when all of these different kinds of players interact in a competitive market and how how does the market shape up that's a great question so I could walk you through how I think that sort of works in the next few years and then how it hopefully will work later down the road. Um, I'd say the, the first and foremost, most important thing is that competition is actually a really good thing for everybody because it sort of makes everybody need to do a better job. And ultimately, that's better for the protocols themselves. So if we're all doing a better job validating these networks and the protocol is going to be in much better shape. If it's easier for more folks to do this at a hobbyist level or at a professional level, then we're all in much better shape as well because there'll be more folks doing it. And the more folks doing it, the more robust and the more resilient these protocols and networks are. And ultimately, that's what we want to see long term in 10 years, right? I want to see a network where it's actually quite hard to stall a network because you know you need to have thousands of validators drop out for that to actually happen. There are tens of, tens of thousands of validators to drop out for that to happen. And, and ultimately, that's like a world that I want to see. I think that you can, we can kind of look to a few other uh, ecosystem. I'm not going to point out any specific ones because, you know, I feel like it's not maybe the right way to do it. But you know, it's, it's not uncommon for a market to start with like a hobbyist market and then some sort of professionalism kind of you know start to form around it, and markets start to form around it. So, you know, I'd say like obviously there's I think we're already seeing signals of this where something that maybe was kind of hobbyist ish, you're you're starting to see. A little bit more professionalism, like you said. There's like so you know specific companies focus on validation, and and then some of the more dominant or more incumbent players in the crypto space, like custodians and exchanges, are starting to get involved in validation and staking and proof of stake. So, I think that you know those are all really good things too. I actually think that you know this is maybe an unpopular opinion. I think the majority of people, the majority of companies, individuals even the existing staking as a service or staking, you know, validation companies are not that well equipped to scale and run a network at, you know, a a trillion dollar network at, you know, lots and lots and lots of transactions per second and lots of transactions in a year. And I think that we're still sort of early on in the adoption curve uh, of a lot of these different protocols. And, you know, this is kind of getting back to not to shill Bison Trails because it's not why I'm here, but getting a little bit back to sort of why we, why we think what we're doing is important and why we think what we're doing is interesting is we actually think that being a company that's uniquely focused on solving this exact problem, we can make everybody better and give the power to some of the smaller folks that maybe only some of the bigger folks have resources to invest in. So as a company and as a service provider that can do things that are incredibly professional, that are focused entirely on infrastructure, security and securing and validating networks, we can actually put tools in the hands of an independent hobbyist or an independent company or a smaller company that say, for instance, a large exchange or a fidelity, like you mentioned, could normally only afford and spend, you know, two, three years researching and building. And so ultimately, the goal long term is to make it so that lots of people can participate and compete. 
And the only way you can compete is if, you know, you're actually providing value and services that are equal to everyone else in the ecosystem. And, and that's why I think like what we're doing is really interesting. And, um, and I'm hoping that like more folks will push us to do better and we can push other, we can make it so that more fo- we're pushing other folks to do better as well. Down the road, like 10 years down the road, I think that, you know, hopefully we'll have a really healthy ecosystem where any, like I said before, anyone who's building a product or service that uses a proof of stake network in any way, shape or form, part of like your, I don't want to call it civic duty, but part of your, you know, crypto ecosystem duty is to help secure the network. And, you know, ideally incentivize networks, design it so that you're actually, it's actually just part of your business as well. And that, you know, maybe it's not your core business and you work with a service provider or you partner with a small company or you partner with a validation company, but you are uh, validating the network. So would it be correct to extend your answer to say that your target market is the sort of hobbies today that can that can run a validator, that can run a decent service, but you foresee this hobbyist getting outpaced by the professional validators like exchanges and by with bison trails you want to give this hobbyist and somebody who just has maybe a few hours a week to dedicate to to validation an equal opportunity vis-a-vis the exchanges and and custodians your target market is not to for example go to the fidelities of the world or the custodians of the world and offer to run their infrastructure for them it's more a business to consumer startup rather than a business to business startup. Is that right? No, it's actually not. So our target market right now and the, what we we currently are working with some of the world's top custodians and exchanges to power their validation on our platform. Currently today, we're trusted by some of the world's top custodians and exchanges as a security and infrastructure provider to be able to do this. So more so is that we think that we can build products and services that are enterprise grade such that a you know a large scale custodian or exchange you know it is is happy using our products and services and similarly provide that access to the hobbyists and the smaller companies so it's not it's less about the target market our target market is still pushing the whole ecosystem forward so we are setting the pace for what it means to securely and successfully run infrastructure on these different networks and by setting the pace we're appealing we're an appealing partner for custodians and exchanges in the space and we're currently seeing that which is great we're also an appealing partner for smaller companies that want to be able to you know run nodes on these networks or validation companies that want to run nodes on these networks and i can talk a little bit about the sort of success case um, we don't so one of the things we don't do is we don't talk about really talk about our customers too much because it's you know for their privacy we, we can't really talk about them and that's part of you know how we work with our customers um, but there's a couple that have called us out publicly that they use us and so we're you know happy to talk about those and i can talk a little bit about like a couple success cases that have been quite cool to see how bison trails gives the power to a small company that only a large company normally would have could you talk a little bit about some of these public ones the one that i know is uh my friend anna at zero knowledge validator but uh other others who are also very public about working with you guys? So we are in the process of making a couple more public. Um, and it's, it's kind of, you know, partially part of our ask as a company is like, we're, we're sort of talking to some of our customers and saying, you know, we generally have that conversation pretty regularly. Like, hey, how would you feel about talking about this? Mostly for the benefit of the ecosystem. But I can speak specifically to Anna and the Zero Knowledge podcast. And, you know, they have, if you go to zkvalidator.com, they have uh, on their website, they talk about like what they're doing and why they're doing what they're doing and that they use our platform to support their validation in Cosmos uh, and in Kusama, which you know obviously will eventually be Polkadot and a host of other protocols that we we support on, on the platform. Um, and to me, that's like a really, really great success case. Uh, you know, it's it's a, a podcast that, you know, that actually stemmed from, I was on the podcast with Anna and she was asking us about what we do and I was explaining this is what we do. And I was like, you know, you could run a you know, zero knowledge podcast validator. And she was like, well, we don't really have like, you know, the skill set and engineering ability and, you know, the time to put into this. Uh, while we could probably figure it out, it's actually quite hard to do really well. And I was like, well, that's the whole point of our platform. Uh, and so we, they, you know, they became a customer of ours and they've been, you know, running their validators on our infrastructure platform, which is really cool. And, and to me, that's like exactly why we're here, right? Like the more ZK validators, the more zero knowledge, you know, folks 
types of folks like the zero knowledge team uh, that want to run infrastructure on these networks, the better it is. Yeah, and, and in their particular case, they're really focused on ZK and really focused on privacy. And they're sort of a mission driven validator. And I think that's great. I think it's fantastic. You know, I think being able to support all the different players in the space is really is a really big piece here. And so I'm really happy to sort of share the, the work that they've been doing there. Out of the customers that without mentioning any names per se, but could you give us like some sort of sense of what makeup, like, you know, what percentage of them are funds, what percentage are exchanges, what percentage are like, you know, things like the podcast, like the ZK validator and more the like hobbyist style ones? Yeah. I know I, you, the truth is I actually don't know those numbers off the top of my head. Otherwise I would, I can give you like ballpark just like from what I do know. And this is totally shooting from the hip. Uh, <laughs> So we work with really what happens is that we work with a lot of folks where um, tokens are uh, aggregated and in more mature networks, we see broader token distribution. So a network like Ethereum, for instance, has like a much broader token distribution than a network like even Cosmos, even while well, Cosmos actually isn't that bad uh, or Tezos isn't that bad. Um, you know, I think like over the next five to 10 years, we'll see much broader token distribution as and more usage, uh, developer usage and products and services are built on these, these protocols. Um, so we tend to work with folks that have, you know, that, that are sort of in possession of a lot of tokens and a lot of these newer networks that does tend to be investors. So either traditional venture capitalists or, you know, the somewhat less traditional, you know, crypto focused or blockchain focused uh, venture capitalists. So we work really closely with those folks. And I would say that, you know, a, probably a big chunk, maybe like half ish of uh, our, our current partners are are in that category. Uh, and then the other half are a mix of large scale custodians, large scale exchanges, and hobbyists as well, and and um, sort of independents like the the zk folks. So it kind of looks like that. Um, it does depend protocol to protocol. So a protocol that has broader distribution, we'll see more folks on the less on the investor side, and a protocol that is like really young that hasn't even launched yet, it tends to like skew a little bit more towards like, hey, these are our investors and they're holding these these tokens and. Um, they want to help participate in scale and, and they want to help uh, secure the network early on. Mm -hmm. Yesterday in prepping for the uh, episode, I, I went on the website and tried to make an account just to, you know, try out the product, play with the dashboard. But it turns out actually at the moment, it's signups are you guys are not accepting open signups and it just has a pop up that says to like contact at this email. So what's like the roadmap towards uh, making it so it, you know, it's open sign up. Anyone can just go make a account as easily as I make an email account and just start validating. Yeah. So there's two questions baked into that one that I'll answer simultaneously because I think it's an important one. Uh, the first is kind of like strategically when we would want to do that or the timing around that. Uh, and then the second is, can you actually do that? And can, can we actually do that? So I'll answer the second question first. So currently, once you've been onboarded onto the platform, it's essentially a we call it a one click. It's actually more like two to three clicks and fill out a couple of pieces of information to deploy a validator into any network. Uh, in some networks, we can actually deploy validators automatically and auto scale them. So like, for instance, in something like Kusama, where uh, you want to optimize your infrastructure uh, based off your stake and based off the, the ecosystem, we can uh, optimize uh, things like that uh, automatically, which is quite cool and very unique of an automatic, uh, an auto scaling platform that we have. So once you've been onboarded onto the platform, um, you can actually go through that process uh, independently by yourself and sort of, you know, I'll just call it click a couple buttons to get a validator up on Cosmos or get a validator up on Tezos or Algorand or Decred or uh, Livepeer or any of the protocols that we support. We currently aren't open for uh, open signups, and there's actually a couple reasons for that. The first is we still think it's kind of early in the ecosystem, and we like to talk to folks about like what their goals are and why they're trying to do what they're trying to do. And under, get just get like a much better understanding both to help our product and our services and also to help them make the right decision. So what we found is that not everybody really understands exactly what they should be doing and why. And we don't tell people what to do, but we help guide them sometimes, you know, and, you know, if someone comes to me and says like, hey, I have 500 atoms or, you know, 500 tezzies, I want to run a baker, I want to run a validator, I, I will tell them like, you probably shouldn't, it's not going to make sense for you to do that. You should probably delegate to one. You know, and here's how you would delegate to one, and here's a whole bunch of them, and and so it's really more about like getting to know the folks that want to be involved in the space uh, than it is about you know being restrictive or stopping people from being able to do what they want to do. Uh, it's really just like understanding what their intents are and what they're looking for in a product and service. 
most our onboarding process actually takes like you know a couple minutes. It's, it's not very, it's not particularly long. And you know, if you, Sunny, if you came to me and you said like, hey, like I want to run a Cosmos validator on Bison Trails, um, it'd be a pretty pretty seamless process. So it, it's more just about like us getting to know the folks that want to be involved in the space than anything else. And and then also, you know, like any product and service that is still quite young, which I you know I think twenty months or twenty four months is still quite young. It's a way for us to always get better and ask people the questions that we <laughs> that we want to ask. Could you talk through a little bit about the how the pricing works? Let's say I do want to run a Cosmos validator on Bison Trails. Is it a sort of fixed fee or is it uh, taking a percentage of the uh, revenues that the validator makes? How does that work? Yeah, so um, generally speaking, it's a fixed fee. We also uh, take a small percentage of whatever you want to call it, inflationary rewards, participatory rewards uh, that a validator makes as well. Um, it generally is quite low, and we think of that as a way to both incentivize and align interests between us, our customers, and the protocols. So, you know, we're in it for the long haul. Uh, we're the protocols that we're on. We want to see them succeed long term, and so uh, we want to make sure that we can be, you know, really aligned alongside our customers and the protocols themselves. Uh, but generally speaking, it's a fixed fee on a monthly basis. So people pay us a monthly fixed fee to run a validator on our platform, and. That is really dependent on the protocol itself and dependent on how the protocol is set up and what those validators or those nodes need to be able to do. So we have built pretty, what I would consider, cutting edge technology around cloud orchestration, computing, infrastructure, deployment, management platform that's you know by default, multi-cloud, multi-VPS, multi-zone, multi-region with redundancy built into it and scaling built into it. And so that's a pretty professional type service that, you know, even some of the best enterprise companies in the world that aren't in the blockchain space aren't even doing. And we've done that in a way for an ecosystem where, let's be real, a lot of the software is still beta software. Um, So we're actually quite proud of the platform that we've built. And so it really depends on like the protocol itself. Like, what does that need to do? And, um, you know, what kind of security do we need to be able to support here? You know what? What does our HSM setup look like? What are those? What does that redundancy look like? Stuff like that. Right. So maybe we can jump into that a little bit. So when I use Bison Trails, what exactly am I getting? I'm assuming I'm getting something a little bit more than just some like Terraform scripts that you guys wrote, and I just go deploy them. So what what exactly goes into designing of your orchestrator system? And like, do you guys handle the monitoring? Do you guys handle Do you guys have physical nodes somewhere or is it all cloud-based? Yeah, could you walk us a little bit through the technical design? I can. I'm going to very deliberately walk through the technical design, but kind of at a in an abstract fashion, but still technically. Um, just because like, you know, part of what we do is, you know, the stuff that we do is is, you know, part of like the what I would call like, you know, really exciting secret sauce of Bison Trails and why we're good at what we do. So the first thing is is that it's uh, entirely uh, interface-based interaction with our customers. So we don't ship you Terraform scripts, for instance, um, you know, but we're built on top of modern technologies like Helm and Terraform and Kubernetes. And, um, and we're built in multi-cloud, multi-zone, multi-region fashion. So we can actually move, easily move nodes and portions of nodes or uh, microservices around nodes around the world very, very quickly and very easily. And so that can be like, you know, Sentry, for instance, or a query and transaction portion of a node cluster. Um, and so what we do is we build security and we build monitoring and we build redundancy and scaling into our node clusters automatically for our customers. So you don't actually have to go and deploy anything. You come on, you become a customer, you click a button, and we make sure that everything is working perfectly and well and in the right place and communicating well and signing blocks and producing blocks, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what it's like to use us as far as um, how technical you want to get into that. It's actually like on a, you know, we work with our customers. Some of our customers, we have like things like secure API, you know, either RPC or, or um, API access to node infrastructure themselves. We will do combination of cloud and uh, bare metal deployments, depending on the protocol itself as well. So um, we do a lot of cloud work, but we also, in some instances, do have uh, bare metal deployments uh, for portions of node clusters that are distributed all around the world, data cent- secure data centers all around the world as well uh, that interact with our uh, infrastructure platform to make sure that we can 
securely sign blocks, you know, using the right like hardware security modules and uh, making sure that, you know, we're not at risk of leaking any keys, like stuff like that. And so from a technology standpoint, uh, it's super, super modern uh, and super cutting edge and can uh, auto scale and has really great failover processes. The thing that isn't the technology platform, which is really great, is we actually offer um, support and services around what we do as well. So if there are issues, we have communication channels with our customers. If you have questions about how protocol works or what's going on, <laughs> you can call someone and ask them about what's going on and why it's working that way. We're constantly monitoring. So we obviously have like things like enterprise-grade DevOps teams as well. They're monitoring 24-7 with things like response teams and resp- and catastrophe response teams and incident reporting and pager duty in the event that you know things do go wrong uh, you you can kind of sleep well knowing that you never really have to worry about this and someone else is on it so is it correct to imagine that like so my imagination of what's really happening behind the scenes so i go to bison trails and i click a bunch of buttons and what's really happening on the bison trails infrastructure is Essentially, like a bunch of Docker containers are probably spinning up specific to me. And these containers are spread across, let's say, two or three different cloud vendors, AWS, Google Cloud. Maybe one of these containers is is signing on, on my behalf. And then there's failover. So if this particular container dies, there's some other system that will activate one of the other containers to sign on my behalf. And in this entire process, my validation keys are somehow treated in a way that only I know my validation keys. Bison Trails doesn't. Is, is that the right imagination? So it's definitely a lot more complicated than that. Uh, <laughs> in that, uh, imagine you were to do that. But so there's a couple of things I won't talk about mostly from a secu- because of security. I won't talk about specifically how we do things like deployment and orchestration. Uh, but just imagine you were to take what you just described and break it down into much, much smaller pieces uh, and then distribute those all over through a distributed system. We have, uh, in some instances, designed and developed you know, pretty unique containerization processes as well. So it's not just like, like a Docker container that's deployed to like AWS or a Docker container that's deployed to like Azure or something like that. Um, it's actually a, a good amount uh, more uh, broken down into pieces than that. But but some of the fundamentals you're describing is right. So yes, that's right. Your like validation keys are not accessible, except for by you. And it, actually, in most cases, they're not accessible really by you either. They're not accessible by anybody. Uh, and so, you know, they can be destroyed by you, for instance. But but that's about it. But yeah, that's uh, in in a lot of ways. There's pretty close to to a lot of what we do. Uh, and then manage, monitor, upgrade, update, and make sure that failover processes are working well and signing processes are working well and then message propagation is optimized. So imagine a world where you have part of your clusters that are moving to optimize for receiving and sending messages in the protocol itself. Spending time thinking through, you know, one, one of the things that we've noticed is that like an overwhelming number of proof of stake protocol infrastructure is run on AWS East. So spending a lot of time making sure that uh, the protocol itself at a protocol level is uh, decentralized is something that we're we're really excited and focused on in that there's sort of uh, much broader uh, VPS participation in the protocol itself. So if we see that, you know, half a protocol is running on AWS East, we'll probably not be <laughs> putting nodes on AWS East, but being able to do things like that, which is really interesting. What pieces get reused across uh, participation clusters? So, you know, let's say you have like, five customers all running Cosmos nodes. What pieces are, are they going to be like sharing Sentry nodes or, or are they like all of these validators are completely independent from each other? Yeah, sure. Good question. So one, I'm actually the wrong person to ask about that question because I personally didn't design it. Um, and two, I actually don't think that we would say um, just from a security perspective, it's a little bit dangerous to sp- speak specifically to that. What I will say is that we building an enterprise grade platform uh, means that you 100% need to create delineation between customers. And so we generally treat customers infrastructure independently of anybody else's. So there's very little shared resources, if any at all, but I won't, I won't, I I don't want to confirm or deny either of them just from a security perspective, it's a little too dangerous. What about within a customer? So let's say, you know, 
Cosmos, for example, I can run a validator with different weights. But on some networks like Kusama, each validator has a fixed weight. And so if I want to, if I have more stake than the fixed weight, I, I have to run multiple validators. Would I have to run a new participation cluster for each of these validators? Or could I have it so I'm running mul using one cluster and just putting a bunch of keys on one node? Yeah, so we will both optimize for, try to optimize for security and infrastructure reliability in those cases. So it really kind of depends on the protocol itself and how how the protocol is, in, in particular, like for, for Kusama, for instance, like it depends like how the protocol is working. And, and so, we, you know, I don't think we ge we actually generalize it all that well. In some, in some instances, in particular with those different protocols, we will, you know, design that in a way that's optimized for both. We can optimize your node infrastructure, your validator infrastructure in the network itself based off of network conditions and your stake, which is really quite cool. And that's something we can do automatically if you want us to. Do you guys ever end up modifying node software to increase security? So for example, you know, myself and Chorus have been like walking through some ideas of how to modify Tenement Core in order to allow better like failover systems. So do you guys ever end up doing any like software development work to help improve the node infrastructure in that way? Yeah, it really depends on the protocol we have uh, in some ways. That would be something that we would most likely open source if we were going to do. So we're not, we're not, um, if we are going to go through the process of modifying node software itself to help for whatever it is. Like I, I can give you an example right now. We're actually talking to one of a protocol team about making small changes to help with sort of key management uh, on the nodes themselves. And, you know, we'll sort of take it a few different avenues there. Sometimes we'll talk, we'll work directly with the protocol teams themselves and help them understand why it matters and let them make those changes. Sometimes we will propose or try to make pushes upstream to a protocol. Um, but that's a, that type of thing is the kind of thing that we believe should be open and public and open source. And uh, part of our community development should be, you know, helping the protocols get better and making folks understand why those things are important. And so, you know, and, and, and also, quite frankly, like, should be up to the community. So the answer to your question is like, no, we're not really. And if we do, it's normally out in the open and open source. So as a uh, protocol developer, one of the things I think about a lot is about some of the centralization risks of the network and, you know, putting a lot of effort into helping encourage decentralization. Yeah. How do you guys think about some of the centralization risks you may pose by having everyone depending on, or not everyone, of course, but a large number of people depending on your guys' infrastructure? First off, I appreciate the vote of confidence, Sonny. I think that we would love if a lot of people were depending on our infrastructure. <laughs> We're, you know, obviously still, we're still growing and we're excited about our position in the market. And uh, we think we're helping a lot of folks in a lot of different ways. I think it's a very good question, but I also think, quite frankly, that a lot of the sort of conversations that I've had around decentralization are basically drawing arbitrary lines in the sand around whatever is, this doesn't, I don't mean this to come out like combative because I actually don't mean it in a combative way, but it's like sort of often for convenience for whoever you're talking to. They sort of like draw a line in the sand. It's like, well, here's my line in the sand, but don't, you know, this is, it's on this side of me, you know, like eh, there's, there's, you know, pieces of that, that I think that, so there's, there's two things that are important to me. One is that from an ethos perspective and an emission perspective, decentralization is a path that we are constantly working on is a uh, product and technology path that has constant staffing against. So we want to end up in a world where we can be a force for helping decentralize the networks um, without posing additional risk to the protocols themselves. And we've been put in positions where at some point we would be running to what specifically in a BFT network where we would be running too much of a network and potentially cause, not even like necessarily cause, but potentially cause issues with that network. Uh, and we've opted to not bring on new customers in that network because of that. And so just from like a mission perspective, we're pretty aligned with making sure that we're doing the right thing for the protocols themselves. So, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, is that, you know, we do a lot of work to help decentralized networks. And so, yeah, sure, you could have folks that are depending on Bison Trails infrastructure platform. But if we build it in a way where ownership and we move towards a world where, you know, ownership of keys or ability to move things around um, or outside of our control and potentially verifiably outside of our control, 
that's actually a really interesting way to help combat some of those issues as well. And then you know, the last thing I would say is kind of something I mentioned before, which is like, we make it easier for people to run nodes and validators around the world in different zones and different regions on different VPSs. That's actually something that is really hard to do. And when left to their own devices, most protocols don't see that independently. So if you like I mentioned this earlier, like there's plenty of protocols where we see like a huge portion of that network run on AWS East. That's not because people are, think it's the right thing to do. It's because people know and do what they know best. And what people do and know best is AWS East. <laughs> and that's unfortunate for the protocol. And so there's actually a very, very strong case where we are creating enterprise grade redundancy uh, and infrastructure deployments that are geographically distributed, that are VPS distributed, that have independent geographic failovers that doesn't exist in the ecosystem without us, which is which is really quite cool. Uh, and that's something I'm really excited about. And then, you know, the last thing I would say is like every computer on the internet runs Linux and no one's asking about that. Do you guys think that you have an obligation to disclose your how many customers you have on a particular network. So like, because I think it at least helps without disclosing who they are, but at least giving a ballpark of like, do 1% of the validators use this, do 5%, do 51%. How do you guys think about that? That's actually a really good question too. Do I think we have an obligation? No, I don't think we have an obligation. We're a privately owned and operated company. So I don't think we're obliged to. Do I think that like ethically and sort of from a mission perspective, should we? I meant like moral obligation. Yeah, like morally. Or civic obligation. I think that that's right. I think that there's like a right way to do that and a wrong way to do that. And there's also like the right time to do that and the wrong time to do that. Right now, we operate that way internally, where we're paying close attention to those things. And we're sort of making internal company decisions based off of our penetration or our ability to do a really good job of solving the problems or do a better job than the market. And so we're being careful. Something I could see us doing down the road is sort of like, that makes a lot of sense, right? Like we want to protect the, the privacy of our customers and we want to protect the security of our customers and security of our systems. But also, like I said before, like we are incentive aligned to see these networks be successful, which means that if we put ourselves in a position to be detrimental to the network, we're not helping anybody, including ourselves. I could see a world down the road where we're a little bit more public about our position in a network itself. And, and also like being public about like parts of our roadmap about how we're help, how trying to help solve those problems. And what are the issues and what are the things that we're doing way better? You know, kind of like what I'm, I'm describing now, like how are we making that better and how are we more dangerous? Earlier, you mentioned that you've turned away some customers one if when you felt that it would imply a lot, a large percentage of the stake was running on your infrastructure. Do you give us a sense of what's the line in your mind when you would turn away customers for a particular network? So that's a good question. There's like the very obvious BFT lines, right? If you're 3F over M plus one of the network, then you can actually hold the network. So there's that, right? If you're running more than a third of the network in a BFT network, you can hold the network. That's no good. If you're running two thirds of the network, you can actually alter the chain. And that's also no good. So in our head, until we have solved a lot of the using technology to solve a lot of the decentralization issues that we think we might be bringing from a risk perspective, we would most likely never run more than 30% of a network or whatever, 33% of a network. Could you give us a sense just out of my personal curiosity, what magnitude of the Cosmos hub network you guys are operating? Out of my own curiosity, what magnitude of the Cosmos hub do you think we're operating? Somewhere between 10 to 20% would be my personal guess. I love it. That's fantastic. We're not of the Cosmos hub. We're not as big as that. I actually don't know, but it's not even like 10 to 20%. That would be phenomenal. If we were running 10 to 20% of the Cosmos Hub, that would be amazing because we'd be doing a phenomenal job orchestrating the validators <laughs> on that network. On Cosmos, I actually wrote a proposal, hasn't been pushed to the chain yet, but called proportional slashing. And you guys actually wrote a pretty good response to it. It's the idea that we should punt, wet, only in the case of slashing, should we punish validators more heavily the larger they are. So if a validator of 5% of the stake gets double signs, you'll get slashed much more heavily than someone who's 1% of the, of the network. As part of that proposal to stop civil attacks, where that one validator of 5% is split into five validators, we do have to account for correlation, where we basically say, okay, look, if five of these validators all go down at roughly the same time, we can kind of 
punish that as well as like one validator at 5% going down. And that has this sort of side effect of heavily harming your architecture where, like I know you guys spend a lot of time on decorrelating a lot of your architecture, but let's say there's something that goes wrong with the like, I don't know your exact infrastructure, but let's say like there is some sort of central point of failure in your orchestration system. It does. People who are using your infrastructure are probably more correlated than people who are not, assuming they're not all running on AWS East. So what are some of your thoughts on proportional slashing? First off, thanks for the work that you've been doing in Cosmos on that. I think like having focusing through this problem is, a, is an important part of community development and um, the maturation of the network itself. I do remember sort of seeing that and I do remember us sort of writing our thoughts on uh, proportional slashing. I think ultimately where we netted out and obviously we're totally open to interpretation and to conversation and, and debate about this is that um, platform like Bison Trails, because of the amount of work that we do to decorrelate our infrastructure deployments, sort of puts us in a, an advantage over a smaller validator in the ecosystem. I think where we netted out is like, we're not sure if this is the right answer, but it's maybe it's probably the right questions to ask. Like you said, like if they're not using AWS East and they're not, you know, doing XYZ and they're not using Docker and they're not using Linux and they're not doing all these things, then like, you know, they'll be more correlated if they're using Bison Trails. And I actually think that that's not necessarily true. I don't think you would be surprised since you guys are infrastructure operators and validator operators. Like a lot of folks are using Docker. A lot of folks are using Linux. A lot of folks are using AWS. Having a sort of enterprise grade platform that is multi-zone, multi-region, multi-cloud, and then has like infrastructure setups that are uh, decorrelated can be super helpful to the protocol. And someone who is using Bison Trails might actually be less likely to be proportionally slashed in, in a correlated fashion. One of the things that you guys wrote was that you th guys think it's a, it's probably a bit too early for proportional slashing on the Cosmos network. And so I actually wrote a response to that kind of saying that in thanks to you guys post there, I actually went ahead and modified the spec because I think you guys made a valid point. And so I actually altered the spec so we can actually make it more gradual over time. So we can start in the original design. I had it so it always uses a one of the parameters was a two and it, I was kind of hard coded in there. I made it so that's actually a dynamic value. So if we start from zero, it kind of slashing stays exactly how it is today. And then over time, governance can kind of increase it. So we could go from zero to 0.5 to one to 1.5 to two, maybe even higher. I don't know if, if we'd ever want to go higher than two really, but by the two, I mean like it's sort of quadratic. So if it's one, it's linear in regards to correlation. If it's zero, it doesn't care about correlation at all. So do you think that this is something that's like a reasonable approach to take? I don't think I know. Our position was that it's a little bit early. And the reason why our position was a little bit early is because a lot of, you know, like not to pick on Cosmos, but Cosmos still has plenty of professional validation services, but also like has plenty of hobbyists and it would put hobbyists at a disadvantage. To think of a world where someone who's like running a hobby validator on Cosmos can recover from an outage faster than a platform that's designed to be VPS independent and geography independent. Seems kind of crazy to me. Do you think it's an issue on other protocols like Polkadot? Because I know they're starting with proportional slashing as well. I think it's an issue on every protocol, and I think it's completely fine. We mentioned this in our response, like this would actually be good for our business, but it might hurt the ecosystem and discourage independent folks from being involved early on because of the risks. We don't want to see that either. You know, like we're sort of looking at it as like, how do we get more people? Not how do we make it so people are afraid and less people do this? I like the idea of having governance parameters help decide what the proportional slashing should be. And so that to me makes a lot of sense, right? It's like, okay, this is still kind of an experiment and we are agreeing or acknowledging that it's, we don't know the perfect answer here and that like let's set ourselves up to be able to change it if we're wrong. I think we also have to recognize the magnitude of what slashing is. There's a loss of funds in slashing. It's very, very real. A mistake with decisions around proportional slashing could be pretty detrimental to an independent validator or an independent staking company, not necessarily an independent one, but just like a smaller one. Like let's say it's not Binance, right? It's like, you know, a smaller company that's doing this. Like that's pretty bad. Like Binance loses a couple million bucks. They probably don't care. You lose a couple million bucks. Like you're probably pretty mad about it. We're generally in agreement with a lot of this. And I like that we have a nice iteration process going back and forth here and trying to figure out what's the best way to help the network really. I didn't know that the spec was changed 
in part or partially because of some of the stuff that we did. I'm, I'm actually really happy about that. And thanks for listening, I guess. Like, thanks for hearing us out. I you know, appreciate that. That's, that's, like I said, part of what we're trying to do as a company is just move the whole ecosystem forward, make everybody better, make all the networks better. And, and so that's really great. I'm super happy to hear that. So talking of ecosystems, we'd like to move to a different ecosystem, which is Libra. Like Libra is always an attractive topic to talk about because it's unlike so many of the other networks, right? It has a different scale. It has a different approach. It frankly has completely different regulatory challenges to other crypto networks. And Bison Trails has been one of the few blockchain companies that are part of the Libra Association. And so we'd like to hear your thinking on why you joined the Libra Association and how it came to be. So you're right. Libra is a hot topic, to say the least, uh, for us. Folks ask us a lot of questions about Libra, and we are in a uh, somewhat unique position. We're one of the few blockchain companies that's involved in the Libra Association. Last month, I was actually elected to the Technical Steering Committee of Libra, so elected to this technical committee that's governing and uh, overseeing the open source project, which I'm also very proud of. So heavily involved in the technical roadmap and maintenance and commitments to that project itself and super excited to be involved there. You know, I didn't really get a chance to talk about this. I sort of have talked a lot about like bison trails and the infrastructure and kind of why we think what we're doing is important for the ecosystem, but I didn't really talk about, at all about our view, generally speaking, on the ecosystem. So as a company, Bison Trails, and this actually extends myself and my co-founder and our company, is really what we would call protocol agnostic or blockchain agnostic, in that we think that the space, the technology that's being built, and the sort of moral and ethical changes that are happening are an important part of the sort of technical advancement of the world as a whole. And I know that sounds like kind of very fluffy and big and, and grandiose. The company was designed to do that. So I believe we support eight protocols in mainnets right now. And then we're in the process of either some form of test phase or test net or pre mainnet or, you know, whatever adversarial test net with another 20 plus protocols. We're not a platform that's designed to and built to support one protocol. We're actually designed and built to support many protocols. And the whole idea here is that we think that there's the world will be made up of many different blockchains and protocols. Some of them will be generalists, some of them will be currency, some of them will be application specific, some of them will be smart contracting platforms, some of them will be video transcoding platforms, you know, whatever it is. And there's plenty that haven't been built or designed yet that we haven't seen. And that if we make it easier to build on top of and orchestrate and participate in these protocols, that we will all be very successful and that the space will be successful. Libra represents different type of protocol than we've normally worked with in the past. It's different in a lot of different ways and what they're trying to do and what we are trying to do, I should say, what they were trying to do originally before we got involved. Obviously, we're involved now. So it's different in what we're trying to do, but also like just generally speaking, the magnitude and scale of the project is pretty different than any other protocol we've worked on. It's really interesting to be sort of involved in the room from a governance perspective with the Libra Association alongside having a one vote alongside Facebook's one vote alongside Uber's one vote. We have a voice in the room that I like to believe is the crypto native blockchain voice, the sort of keeping in mind morals and ethics of the space. And I'm obviously very excited about that and very proud of of that work that we're doing. The story about how we got involved is is actually pretty straightforward. We, for like you said, 20 or 24 months ago, or, you know, two and a half years ago, have been working very closely with a lot of different protocol teams and working in different communities and being involved from the early stages in different communities and have been building some really robust enterprise-grade infrastructure to help support the deployment and orchestration of pretty large-scale protocols. I want to say it was about a year ago, I was uh, at a conference and a mutual friend of mine introduced me to uh, one of the people that was working on building Libra that was at the time a Facebook employee, but was uh, planning to join the Libra Association. And we had a con, you know, they said, hey, like we've talked to lots of folks in the ecosystem. We've heard that you guys are an incredibly technical team that's helping build infrastructure, building robust infrastructure in a way that's, you know, geographically distributed. We'd also had done stuff like open source some code that we'd done for a couple protocols. And they were sort of like, hey, like we have looked at the space a lot. And we've looked at a few of the other companies that are kind of in this space a little bit. And we've seen and heard that like, you know, you guys are doing some of the best work. And so then they did some diligence on a few other folks in the space as well and asked us if we were interested in joining the Libra Association alongside the 99 other partners to help 
govern this blockchain and um, help provide crypto native expertise and blockchain native expertise. I would say the biggest difference for Bison Trails for within Libra is that we're probably a little bit more involved in governance with Libra than we are with a lot of other protocols. We, we are still involved in some governance. And we're pretty involved in the communities and most protocols we engage with. And we work with a lot of these protocol development teams pretty closely. Sonny, I'm sure you've talked to other folks as well <laughs> on our team. But you know, generally speaking, we work pretty closely with a bunch of different protocol teams. I'd say like we're a little bit more involved on the governance side with Libra. And then we're also, obviously, like I, I said before, I was elected to the technical steering committee. So we're involved in the technical governance as well, which is a little bit atypical for us as well. We're not really involved in the technical governance on most protocols. We, we sort of contribute and we have opinions and we talk about proportional slashing publicly and we have, you know, engage in discourse, but we don't necessarily aren't crazy involved on the technical side. Generally speaking, that's kind of how we got involved with Libra. Over the last year, we've been working really closely with the team building the protocol, the Libra core team building the protocol itself. And we've been working really closely with the association. That's how we got involved. That is kind of our, the state of our current involvement. When they asked us to join the Libra association and get involved, I'd say like we were naturally skeptical at first, kind of like asking a lot of questions. What are you trying to do? And what's the purpose? And what is all this? You know, how is this helpful for the ecosystem? And ultimately came to this conclusion ourselves in asking these questions that you know, this really was about creating an independent association that could govern this blockchain and really help move the entire ecosystem forward. And this idea of having access to, you know, literally billions of people and putting crypto and blockchain technology in the hands of billions of people is incredibly appealing to us as a company. We think it helps move all of our mission forward, ours, you know, yours, the work that you're doing, the different protocols. We're all here to help move forward the ecosystem and to help drive more mainstream technological adoption. And we think that this helps that um, significantly. So we're pretty excited about it. When I first saw a bison getting involved in Libra, it didn't make sense at all. Because on the one hand, you know, the business model of bison is to help people run validators. And on the other side, to run a validator on Libra is $10 million. So what's bison really doing there? doesn't make any sense. I think that that's maybe like a nuance in this idea of like $10 million and what that actually does. Running a validator and orchestrating a network that secures trillions of dollars of assets and you know, transfers billions or tens of billions or hundreds of billions, of billions of dollars worth of assets has nothing to do with investing in or giving money to or helping support the treasury of or you know whatever you want to describe like $10 million. They're, they're kind of independent of each other. For us, this was entirely about, like you said, right, Bison Trails is a company and a platform that's designed to help run infrastructure on protocols. In the Libra network, there's 100 independent association members that are going to help secure and validate that network. And we have domain expertise that a lot of these non-crypto native companies don't have. And we have domain expertise that even folks in the crypto space aren't really doing or thinking about. And so this is really about being able to help orchestrate and build a network that can support the scale that Libra is trying to build. And that's why we're involved more than anything else. It really has nothing to do with anything else. So when I think ultimately about the success of Libra, I think about how can Bison Trails help make sure that Libra is safe, secure, orchestrated well, geographically distributed, and is run using everything from best practices to sort of cutting edge technology to make sure it's, it's amazing. The idea of being involved in the project and you know, the original idea of the $10 million was really making sure that everybody in the association is involved in the project and sort of has alignment in the project as well. It's not like a pay to join situation. It's really about like impact. How can you provide impact to the association? What is the, you know, current state of the Libra project? So, you know, a lot of people are aware that like earlier on a, or a couple months ago, a bunch of teams started leaving. But then, you know, it seems that there's a lot of people who are actually joining. So, you know, I was scrolling through your Twitter before this episode, and I saw that Shopify actually just joined the Libra Association. So could you give us some sense of, like, what is the current state and the progress of the Libra project? And when can we expect to see something live? The thing about the Libra in general and being a part of the Libra Association is that it's actually, you know, we're an association of equal members, and it's unfair for me to speak out of turn and on behalf of the association. So I generally try not to. There's sort of bits and pieces about like my involvement that I'm happy to speak about, things like the technical steering committee and the technical pieces of the project. 
So I'm not going to tell you sort of when you should expect things to go live or anything like that. It just one, it's not entirely in my control. And it's also just not fair for me to speak on behalf of the entire association. So I won't do that. From the technology perspective, it's moving along incredibly well. Uh, obviously, the product is open source. You can see it on GitHub slash Libra. You can see the entire roadmap is public. You can see all of the commits to the project itself and sort of what's going on there. And from a technology perspective, it's, it's coming along super, super well. And as a language, Move is pretty incredible. I'm excited about it, at least. There's you know, plenty of reasons why it could be very, very cool. From you know an association perspective, I would say that over the last few months, we've hit some pretty great milestones, including you know officially forming the association in October, which the association talked about, we talked about um, publicly. So that was like, you know, hey, we're actually going to officially create this association. Sort of sign the paperwork, like saying, yeah, like we're an association now. Um, so we did that in October. And then uh, creating the technical steering committee as well. We did that sort of in the late fall before the holidays. We've had new folks, really impactful folks like Shopify join uh, the association. And we're in talks with lots of really great folks that want to be a part of this. Impactful companies that have not just reach, but are have you know really great reputations and are really great technology contributors to the world. So um, we're super excited about all those things. And in terms of like folks leaving the association, I think like any project, as like you know you kind of get involved in the project, you start to ask questions, stuff gets starts to get real. Different people for different reasons at different times decide that it's not right for them at that moment. And the way I see that, and sort of the way that you know my personal opinion on that is that's a, a very fair, level-headed way to approach it. You know, maybe this isn't right for me today. It's not about do I think this is going to be successful or not? Or do I want to be involved ever? It's really like, you know what, right now, I can't contribute the type of time and effort and resources it might take to make this successful. So maybe I should be involved. So you guys recently raised around $25 million in your Series A. Could you tell us a little bit about, you know, what was that process like? And what was sort of the main pitch that you guys gave to investors? And where I'm kind of looking at this as, as well from is um, there was a proof of stake web conference about two or three weeks ago, Victor spoke on that. And one of the general themes that we noticed throughout the conference is that a lot of validators were kind of saying that like, you know, running validators on their own isn't profitable enough. You know, it, maybe it's validation is often just a loss leader in something else. So how does your guys' valuation reconcile with that? Where like, you know, most validators seem to be struggling while you guys aren't a validator, you're an infrastructure company, but but you guys have reached this like great valuation and like valuation isn't the end goal, of course, but like how did that come about? So that's right. In the fall, we raised twenty five and a half million dollars from some really great investors, um, including Blockchain Capital, Kleiner Perkins, Sound Ventures, and um, our existing cap table also all participated as well. I'm forgetting some folks in there. There's a couple other really great investors that are involved that I always forget whenever I talk about <laughs> whenever I talk about our investors, I always forget to mention them, but they all know I love them. A little bit about the process and why and sort of like how we're seeing the world differently and what the pitch looks like. And I think you you sort of hit the nail on the head yourself, actually, as you were sort of introducing the topic. We're not a validator company. Our entire mission is about democratizing access, making it easier to run infrastructure on these protocols. We have seen some traction in particular in a highly secure, a highly important part of the ecosystem, which is staking and participating in these networks, something that we do incredibly well. And we support the sort of deployment, orchestration and management of lots of different folks participation in these blockchains. And so for us, it's really about like, we are poised for long term success in the ecosystem and less about independent by protocol extraction. Unfortunately, there's some folks that are looking at validation and they're like incredibly aligned and they're amazing and I'm super excited that they exist. And there's some folks that are looking at validation as like, how do we extract as much money as possible from a protocol? And so we look at this much, much longer term than the dominance or the sort of penetration of proof of stake in the blockchain ecosystem today. If you look at proof of stake in general, it's actually still quite small. The amount of staking that's happening is in some networks is like kind of high, but in a lot of networks is still not high at all. We're seeing new types of products and services that are being built either on or adjacent to some of these new protocols. So for us, it's like, really, how do we support the entire ecosystem? And that really is like the gist of it. It's, it's just staying true to our mission and our vision. It's like, we want to make it easier for people to participate. We're seeing traction in staking. We're a pure play technology provider. So we don't package assets. We're not trying to build a financial services company. We're not doing lending or trading or anything like that. We're really just making it easier for companies for developers, for entrepreneurs to build and deploy infrastructure in these different protocols. 
that's kind of like, you know, there's not, not really much to it more than that. That's like, that's our pitch and that's what the company is doing. And it's, you know, publicly stated on our website. The process itself is not easy, I would say still. I mean, like, you know, crypto is still kind of, I mean, obviously like the last few months have been not too bad from a market perspective, but I think investors are still like a little afraid about uh, blockchain and crypto in general. I think in 2017 scarred a lot of investors. They thought that a lot of these projects were going to ship and they were going to be like, you know, transformative. And there's a lot left to be desired from a lot of the different uh, blockchains and protocols that have even launched. And like anyone building in a nascent industry, it's always hard uh, to convince people that what you're doing is super important. And so we, we went through that as well, too. You know, it's like a, not an easy thing for me. And I spend a lot of time trying to convince people that what we're trying to do is super impactful. And that's really the gist of it. And, you know, we're obviously really excited about the position that we're in and the protocols we can help support. And uh, if we make it easier for more people to participate and more people to build in the space, then that's a win. That's what we're trying to see. And that's why we're sort of at the stage that we're at. What can we expect to see next, like in the next few months? Like what kind of new networks are you supporting and what are you excited for? We are incredibly excited about more than 20 protocols that we are supporting that are in some form of like pre-main net or, you know, late stage test net. And we're excited, very excited for those things all to go live. Things like Polkadot and Scale and New Cypher and, you know, Near and MobileCoin and Solana and Celo and Coda. There's some really incredible projects that are coming out that we've been supporting for more than a year, if not almost two years. And we're super excited for all those to come up. So over the next like you know few months, expect to see us continue to support these protocol teams, continue to support their launches. Hopefully, we'll continue to onboard uh, new folks onto the platform. So new entrepreneurs, independent validators, staking as a service companies, custodians, exchanges, just generally speaking, community members that want to help support and validate these networks. So, you know, that's kind of like major focus for us over the next you know, three to six months and then continuing to uh, move the ecosystem forward and move the technology forward. So we're also trying to consistently ship code that helps move our vision and mission forward and, you know, engage with the communities kind of like we did uh, when we talked to, to you all about proportional slashing and our thoughts and trying to help make the entire ecosystem better. So you expect a lot more of that. And you can see a lot of those announcements and sort of conversations are happening uh, on our Twitter at Bison Trails. And uh, also you can see kind of like the protocols we're supporting and the ones we're excited about and any news on our website, uh, bisontrails.co. It was great to catch up with you, Joe. I'm always impressed by Bison because I think it's one of the companies that took a different look at the proof of stake ecosystem really early compared to all of the other players. And you've been one of the most uh, successful with your fresh approach. So congratulations on that. And I look forward to how the future unfolds for Bison and the proof of stake ecosystem in general. Thanks so much. And honestly, we feel the same way. Um, we really you know, appreciate all of the work that the different ecosystem players are putting in and the community development that's happening. And we're really excited to help support everyone in the space. And so really excited to have been on the show. And I really appreciate you guys having me here and continue to ask us the hard questions and continue to have us uh, help push everybody forward. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter and please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much. And we look forward to being back next week.